I'd like to introduce and thank two brand new sponsors to the Peter Schiff Show podcast. Shopify is a platform designed for anyone to sell anything, anywhere, giving entrepreneurs like myself the resources once reserved for big businesses. For a free 14-day trial and full access to Shopify's entire suite of features, go to shopify.com slash gold. And I'd like to thank Avast. Their all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online through a range of features. You can learn more about Avast One at avast.com. Well, I think the market action that we saw this week reveals that the markets have pretty much fully priced in the Fed taper. To the extent that we ever actually get a taper, I think the markets have fully priced any effects, at least the effects that they believe may result from a taper into the markets, which means the tightening cycle to the extent that the only tightening we end up getting is the tapering, it's in the market. So any impact that so-called tightening might have on the markets, on bonds, on gold, on the dollar, that I think that has been discounted into those markets. And so in other words, when the Fed finally begins to taper, it will not affect the markets in the way people think because those expectations have already been priced into those markets. In other words, if we actually get a taper, it is more likely to be a buy the rumor, sell the fact. And so what has been the anticipation In the markets, well, a taper is going to help the dollar because it's tighter monetary policy. Well, that's already happened then. Any benefit that the dollar would expect to gain from the taper, it's already achieved that benefit. And so when we finally get the taper, the dollar is more likely to go down rather than go up. Opposite with gold. Everybody expected the Fed tightening to be bearish for gold. And as a result, they got out in front of that and sold gold. So by the time the Fed gets around to tapering, gold is going to go up. Again, buy the rumor, sell the fact. And I think a lot of this is pretty obvious from the way the markets reacted to the press conference that we had on Wednesday. It was the topic of my last podcast, but that was the most hawkish press conference I've ever heard Powell deliver. Now, again, it's all relative, right? So it wasn't really the most hawkish. It was the least dovish. But in a world where there are no hawks, being less dovish is what now qualifies you as being hawkish. But if you accept on face value what Powell was saying, And of course, I went through how there were so many inconsistencies in his comments that you really can't accept them on face value because on the face of it, he's basically telling lies. But if you believe the lies, what did Powell say? Powell said that the taper is probably going to start the end of this year, but then it's probably going to finish by the middle of next year. So that's basically about a six months time span where the Fed is going to go from doing $120 billion of purchases of bonds and mortgages per month to zero. We're talking about $120 billion to zero in six months. Now, the Fed is saying that the tapering process is going to be very slow and very gradual. Well, if the whole thing is going to be wound down in six months, that doesn't seem like it's slow or gradual at all. I mean, it's going to happen a lot quicker than the last taper they did. And look at how much damage that ultimately did. So if you accept the Fed's comments at face value, well, the markets were just told that all of this monetary support is going to end by the middle of next year. That is really not what markets were expecting. I think markets expected that the tapering timeline would be far longer, that the Fed might take years before it finished tapering down to zero. In fact, if you look at how active the Fed still is, 
in the bond market right now. Look at the numbers we got on the balance sheet on Thursday after rising by 91.5 billion in the prior week. The balance sheet shot up another 41 billion last week, so that's over 130 billion in the last 2 weeks. The balance sheet now stands at an all-time record high, 8. Point four nine trillion, and despite all of that buying over the last couple of weeks, bond prices are getting hammered. In fact, they were hammered pretty hard again today, and interest rates finished up quite a bit on the week. For example, the yield on the ten-year Treasury rose from one point three seven to one point four six on the week, ending the week with the highest yield of the week. Look at the thirty-year. There, the yields went from 1.909 to 1.988. So almost back at 2% now on the yield for the 30-year Treasury. Now, of course, 2% is still an extremely low yield. But of course, the risk is that we go much higher from here. And the problem with that is the enormity of the amount of debt that's currently in the system. And if yields have bottomed, And I've been looking for a bottom in Treasury yields for years. And so far, we haven't found one. But if we have, if the lows are in for yields, then yields are going much higher. And that would also mean that the bull market in bonds is over and that the long overdue, highly anticipated bear market in bonds has just begun. And just like the last bull market was probably the mother of all bull markets, seeing yields you know, go down to all-time record lows, it stands to reason that the mother of all bull markets would be followed by the mother of all bear markets. And if this is going to be the mother of all bear markets, then you have to look at the last major bear market in bonds. And that's the one that ended in 1980, right, with yields at 20% on the short end and maybe 14% on the high end. And if this bear market is going to be worse than that one, just imagine what it's going to do to an economy that's far more leveraged than the economy was back then. And in fact, because the damage would be so great from that type of bear market this time, so much worse than it was last time. That's why I think the Federal Reserve is committed not to allow that bear market in bonds. And so we're going to end up with an even bigger bear market in the dollar because that's the trade-off. Either the Fed allows bonds to crash or the Fed prints enough dollars to buy bonds so that bonds don't crash and the dollar crashes instead. And we had a major bear market in the dollar in the 1970s as well, right? It was a bear market in bonds and the dollar. And so that was a double whammy if you're a foreigner and you own U.S. bonds, because not only were you losing money as bond prices collapsed, but we were rubbing salt in your wound because you were losing on the FX. So if you were at in Deutschmarks or you were in Japanese yen and you bought U.S. treasuries, you got hammered on the foreign exchange rate in addition to the bond loss. Well, the only way we can make the bond bear market less severe or less ferocious is if we exacerbate the dollar bear market. So next time around, the losses will be more in the exchange rate for the dollar than in the nominal price of bonds. But I think in real terms, the losses for holding U.S. bonds will be just as great. And it's not just for foreigners. It's for Americans who hold U.S. bonds because there it's not the foreign exchange risk. It's just the purchasing power risk because prices, consumer prices during the inflation that we're going to get this decade are likely to be much worse than what we got during the 70s. Even though the 70s are used as an example of the worst inflation we've experienced, we're going to experience it even worse this time because we are not in a position to swallow the medicine that we swallowed in 1980 with respect to interest rates and the bond market because of the enormity of the level of debt. So given a choice to pick its poison, I think the poison the Fed is going to pick is to debase the dollar and allow inflation to get worse rather than 
do what Paul Volcker did and allow asset prices and the economy to roll over because the degree to which asset prices will fall and the economic damage that will ensue in the aftermath of that policy is too great for the Fed to allow it. And I think now, too, you have a worldview of inflation, of money printing. Now that you have the popularity of modern monetary theory, I think you have a lot of people that actually think that we can get away with it. You didn't have that much economic stupidity back in 1980. I mean, I'm sure there were still some people that had crazy ideas, but nothing like the harebrained ideas that people have today. And of course, we've gotten away with printing so much money for so long. Well, we just think we could do it indefinitely. I think back then, uh, cooler heads prevailed. We realized that there was a limit to how much money we could print and that we had reached that limit. And so we stopped. But at this point, I think the hubris is that there is no limit and we will continue to print indefinitely. Shopify is more than just a store. It lets you connect with your customers, helps you drive your sales, and manage your business day to day. Shopify is a platform that's designed to enable anyone to sell anywhere, giving you the resources once reserved for just the biggest businesses and customized just for you with a great looking online store that brings your ideas to life and brings you the tools to manage and drive your sales, making your idea real and opening up endless possibilities. Believe me, this podcast started as a shortwave radio show, Wall Street Unspun, that I did once a week for an hour and then I built it into something with a far greater audience All businesses that start out small can one day be something much, much larger. That's why I love how Shopify makes it easy for anyone to succeed in running a small business. Shopify powers over 1.7 million entrepreneurs from their first sale to a full-scale distribution. And every 28 seconds, another small business owner makes their first sale on Shopify. Get started by building and customizing your online store now with no coding or design experience required. You can access powerful tools to help you find customers, drive sales, and manage your business day to day. Gain the knowledge and confidence you need with the resources that will help you succeed. Plus, with 24-7 support, you're never alone. More than just the store, Shopify grows with you. This is the possibility and it's powered by Shopify. So go to shopify.com slash gold, all lowercase for a free 14-day trial and to get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. So start selling on Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash gold right now. In fact, one of the ways that you can see this hubris really manifest itself is regarding the renewed calls for the U.S. government to sidestep the debt ceiling debate by just minting a trillion dollar platinum coin and just depositing that trillion dollar platinum coin at the Federal Reserve in exchange for one trillion dollars. And now the U.S. government has one trillion Federal Reserve notes that it can now spend And it doesn't have to worry about the debt because it's not borrowing any money. It's just minting it. And now it has all this cash. And they talked about that when Obama was president. I don't remember if they talked about it during the Trump years because we didn't really have the debt showdown during the Trump years. Because when Trump was president, the Republicans didn't care about the debt, right? There was no political farce over we're not going to raise the debt ceiling. It only happens when the Republicans are out of power And then they can get on this high horse and pretend they actually care about deficits and runaway government spending. So I think it was when Obama was president that this idea of a trillion dollar coin became popular. And now, of course, because Republicans are grandstanding again about the debt and they don't want to vote to raise the debt ceiling, you now have this specter of this platinum coin. Of course, the Democrats are playing a game of political theater as well, because as the Republicans correctly point out, the Democrats have the votes to raise the debt ceiling. And the Republicans are saying, we're not going to get in your way. There are no Senate Republicans threatening to filibuster 
a effort to raise the debt ceiling. Remember, when I was running for the United States Senate back in 2010, that was the cornerstone of my campaign. I wanted to be the U.S. Senator to lead the filibuster against raising the debt ceiling because I wanted the government to stop going into debt. I wanted the government to stop spending. And the only way to force the government to stop spending was to draw a line in the sand on borrowing, saying, look, you can't borrow any more money. So if you want to keep spending, you better raise taxes. And if you don't want to raise taxes, then you got to cut spending. And that's what I wanted to do in Washington. But none of the Republican senators who claim they will not vote to raise the debt ceiling are threatening to filibuster if the Democrats try to raise the debt ceiling. They're basically saying, vote to raise the debt ceiling and we're not going to do anything about it. So the Democrats have the votes. So why are they talking about how there's this huge threat out there from not raising the debt ceiling when they can raise it whenever they want just by voting to do it. Obviously, they don't want to be the only ones responsible for the vote. They want to force the Republicans to take some responsibility for all the deficit spending by getting them on record as supporting it too. But the Republicans, they are playing the game by saying, look, you want to spend all this money, then you raise the deficits. But of course, when they were in charge and they wanted to spend a bunch of money, they had no problem raising those deficits. But I want to get back to the point of this trillion dollar platinum coin to explain the absurdity of what they're talking about and how people don't even really understand the monetary principles that supposedly underlie our economy and the Federal Reserve itself. Because first of all, if the U.S. government were to actually mint a trillion dollar platinum coin and then start spending the money, the myth, and it really is a myth, that we have some type of monetary discipline and therefore some kind of fiscal discipline would completely go out the window, right? The idea is we have an independent central bank, so the government has to be fiscally responsible. They just can't print a bunch of money and spend it. They have no power to print money. Only the Federal Reserve can print money, but the Federal Reserve can only print money to the extent that it has assets to back it up. Remember, Federal Reserve notes are notes. They are liabilities. They are one half of the Fed's balance sheet. So what is the other half? The assets. Well, what are the assets of the Federal Reserve? Well, predominantly, their obligations of the U.S. government, their U.S. Treasury bonds or now mortgage-backed securities or actually who knows what the hell they got there now. They've got corporate debt, municipal debt. They own a lot of stuff that they're not supposed to own. And remember, I've talked about that on this podcast, but originally the Federal Reserve wasn't even supposed to own U.S. Treasuries. They had to amend the act to finance the First World War, but it still has assets to offset its liabilities. And so when the Fed conducts monetary policy, let's say the Fed wants to fight inflation. How does it do that? Well, inflation is when it expands the money supply. So to fight inflation, you need to do the opposite. You need to contract the money supply. Well, how does the Federal Reserve contract the money supply? It sells its assets into the market and brings back its liabilities, retires those liabilities. So quantitative easing is creating inflation. So the Fed buys treasuries and prints new money and spends it into the economy because it's buying those bonds with the money it creates. But now those bonds are on its balance sheet. That's what we're just talking about. The Fed has a record high balance sheet because it's got all these assets. Now, if the Fed wants to fight inflation, it needs to contract the money supply. It takes those assets and it sells them into the market. And now The owners of those assets, those who bought those assets from the Fed, they paid the Fed in the Federal Reserve notes. So now those notes go back to the Fed that issues them, and they're basically retired from circulation. So now there is less money in circulation, and the Federal Reserve has returned the assets that it took out of circulation back into circulation. Now, of course, when the Fed starts to sell off its treasury bonds that it bought at record low yields, it's going to take a loss right? Because the market is not going to pay the Fed what the Fed paid the market. And therein lies a big problem because the Federal Reserve, the minute it really has to start shrinking its balance sheet, it is going to suffer a huge loss because it's not going to get back as many Federal Reserve notes as it put in. And by the way, the U.S. Treasury is on the hook for those losses. 
any money the Federal Reserve loses through open market operations, the U.S. government has to reimburse the Fed. That's the law, which means the U.S. taxpayer is on the hook. See, that's the opposite of what's been happening. The Federal Reserve has been making money through its open market operations as it's been buying bonds and pushing the price up. And the Federal Reserve has basically been presenting the U.S. Treasury with a check. Here are your share of our profits because the Federal Reserve by law is not allowed to keep those profits. It has, I think, a 5% return on equity that is allowed and anything above that is paid 100% to the U.S. government. So they're in the 100% tax bracket, which is one of the reasons that the Federal Reserve is highly inefficient, right? Because they have no incentive to have a profit of greater than 5% because all the money goes to the U.S. Treasury. So that's why they have such a beautiful, expensive building. I think probably the most expensive building in D.C. when it was built was because they were in a 100% tax bracket. So if they weren't going to spend it on a beautiful building, they were just going to send it to the U.S. Treasury. But when they start losing money on their open market operations, they don't present the U.S. Treasury with a check. They present it with a bill. And now the U.S. government has to finance that. It's now adding to the deficit. And obviously it's the taxpayer who is presumably on the hook to bail out the Fed when it has these losses. But moving to the idea of the platinum coin, So let's say the U.S. government mints this platinum coin, trillion dollar platinum coin. I mean, first of all, that would be a massive official devaluation of the dollar because you're basically saying that the official price of platinum is one trillion dollars an ounce, right? I'm assuming it's going to be a one ounce coin and they're going to stamp the denomination one trillion dollars on that coin. I mean, think about that. You're saying like the dollar is worth one trillionth of an ounce of platinum, one dollar, right? Because you have a trillion dollars give you one ounce of platinum. That means the official value of the dollar in terms of platinum is like a trillionth of an ounce. In his last evaluation, Nixon brought the official price of gold to $42.22. And that was after the second devaluation. Roosevelt was the first president to devalue the dollar from $20 an ounce down to 35 and then Nixon devalued it twice to where it is now but still the official value of the dollar $42.22 equals one ounce of gold now we know that that's wrong because the market value of gold is $1,750 an ounce even though the official value is just $42 or so an ounce of gold I mean it shows you how much the market has devalued the dollar relative to its official value But if the U.S. government mints a trillion dollar coin, even though it hasn't officially devalued the dollar in terms of gold, it's devalued it massively in terms of platinum, although there is no official price right now of the dollar in terms of platinum because the U.S. government has never issued platinum coins. And the main reason for that is if you go to the Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, right, No state shall make anything but gold and silver coins legal tender and payment of debt. So why mint platinum coins when states can't use those as legal tender? You might as well just print gold and silver because those were the legal tender coins. Now, yes, the government did mint nickels made of nickel and pennies made of copper. Those were never considered legal tender, but they were still used in circulation because you had to have a way to break up a dime for smaller purchases, but it would make no sense to mint any coins out of platinum when platinum is a far more expensive metal than silver. So there'd be no reason to have a platinum coin other than this harebrained scheme to try to get around the national debt. But in so doing, you're basically saying the dollar is worth next to nothing in terms of platinum. One of these days, that may actually happen. Maybe the market price of platinum will actually equal the official price if we end up having a hyperinflation. But the most significant point, not as just the ridiculousness of claiming that you've had such a devaluation in the dollar officially, but if the U.S. government gives the Federal Reserve this $1 trillion coin and says, this is a trillion dollars and now we want a trillion Federal Reserve notes, what asset does the Federal Reserve actually have on its balance sheet to sell in the event that it needs to shrink the money supply to fight inflation? It's got an ounce of platinum. 
How much is an ounce of platinum worth? I don't know. It's worth about $1,000. Well, they have a $1,000 asset and they have a trillion dollar liability. Basically, this type of plan bankrupts the Federal Reserve because it owes far more money than it actually has. Now, you might say, well, no, it has one ounce of platinum, but that one ounce of platinum is worth a trillion dollars. No, it's not. I mean, maybe in the fantasy world of the government, you have a one ounce of platinum that's worth a trillion dollars. But in the real world, no one is going to pay you a trillion dollars for an ounce of platinum when you can buy an ounce of platinum for a thousand dollars. I mean, the price of gold is real. There is a real market for gold. Jewelers are going to buy gold from the government at $1,750 an ounce. Computer chip manufacturers are going to buy gold from the government at $1,750 an ounce because they need the gold. No idiot is going to buy an ounce of platinum from the U.S. government for a trillion dollars. There's plenty of platinum out there that you could buy for a lot less money. Now that you can say, well, it's still a trillion dollars of legal tender, which is true. So if somebody has that trillion dollar coin, I suppose it's the same thing as having a trillion one dollar bills, right? But that's not the type of asset that the Fed can use to take money out of circulation. If the Fed is going to buy a trillion dollars worth of paper with a trillion dollar coin, it hasn't shrunk the money supply at all. It's just taking paper money out of circulation and put this platinum equivalent of money into circulation, but there's been no net drain of liquidity. And so the minute we go down this road, we officially make the United States a banana republic because we say the U.S. government can just issue money, can mint as many platinum coins as it wants and claim they're worth whatever it wants and then spend whatever it wants. And then the Federal Reserve has zero ability to ever undo what is being done. They can expand the money supply, but they can never contract the money supply. And so then the Fed is officially an engine for perpetual inflation. Now, unofficially, that's what it's been the entire time. But if the Fed were to do this platinum coin maneuver, then we would drop all pretense. Now, of course, I don't think that's going to happen because they are going to raise the national debt. So they're not going to have to jeopardize what's left of the supposed independence of the Fed. I think they realize that they can't let that cat out of the bag. But again, when people talk about it as if this is some panacea or as if this can even work, it just shows you how little the mainstream or even a lot of people in government even understand the monetary system of the United States or the Federal Reserve. Avast has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years, and it's trusted by over 435 million users. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online through a range of features. And you can learn more about Avast One by going to avast.com. Avast offers an award-winning antivirus that stops viruses and malware from harming your devices also protects you against data breaches, enabling you to find out if your online accounts have been compromised and whether your passwords need to be changed. They have firewall protection, keeping your personal information secure and preventing attacks that seek to access your computer and steal your data. They'll even protect you from ransomware and secure your personal photos and documents and other files from being modified, deleted, or encrypted by ransomware attacks. In fact, it'll even speed up your computer by optimizing the background activity in your apps. Its smart scan feature finds and removes viruses and resolves the most common privacy and performance issues through its optimization scan. Avast prevents over 1.5 billion attacks every month And with Avast One, you can confidently take control of your online world without worrying about viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, or other cyber crimes. You can learn more about what Avast One can do for you by going to avast.com. I want to swing back, though, and talk about what the markets actually did on the week, because pretty much all of the stock market indexes, save the NASDAQ, ended the week positive. Again, despite the big drop that we had on Monday regarding all the Evergrande fears and the potential contagion that would spill out of China over to the rest of the world, and again, the least dovish FOMC press conference breaking a string of 
every conference basically being more dovish than the conference that preceded it, we finally had a conference that was actually less dovish and the market shrugged that off too. Again, just the NASDAQ was down and it was only down a little bit. I mean, there was a lot of selling in tech this week to drive that down. But S&P, Dow, even Russell 2000 managed to finish the week with gains. In fact, the markets even shrugged off generally weaker than expected economic data. Look at all the data points that came out on Thursday following my Wednesday podcast. Probably the least bad was the Chicago Fed's National Activity Index because even though that one came in well below estimates, the consensus was 0.5, we got 0.29, there was an upward revision to the prior month that was originally reported as 0.53, was revised upward to 0.75, but the rest of the news was pretty much bad across the board. Look at the jobless claims. They were expecting just 309,000 claims And that would have followed 332,000 claims for the prior week. Instead, they revised that up to 355,000. But the current week came in at 351,000 jobs, way above the consensus. In fact, the high end of the range was 311,000 job losses. We came in with 351,000. That is a big beat over what the markets had been expecting. So weaker jobs. Look at the PMI composite index, the flash index. It was supposed to be 55.5. It came in a full point below that 54.5. Manufacturing 60.5 instead of 60.8. And the service index, that was only 54.4 versus an expected 55.1. So Across the board, weaker Kansas City Fed manufacturing index. They were looking for 29. In fact, the range of expectations was from 25 to 31. We got 22, well below the low end of estimates. So again, we're getting weaker economic data as price pressures continue to mount. More and more companies are announcing substantial price increases all the while the Fed is pretending that these price increases are restricted to a small segment of the economy even though they're widespread and are affecting the entire economy so more and more pressure on prices to go up as the economy continues to slow stagflation is obviously what's going on now gold did not finish the week positive But it was barely down. I mean, the price of gold only fell by a few dollars, even though we had this Fed threatening to completely end quantitative easing by the middle of next year. You only saw a few dollars sell off in the price of gold. Same thing with the dollar. The U.S. dollar barely moved higher on the week. And that is not something that one would expect given the comments from the Fed, unless, of course, the market has already fully priced those comments in, which is my thought process and what I expressed earlier in the podcast. The one market, though, that I think really should be surprising and worrisome to people was the oil market. We had a very strong week in oil. Despite a lot of weaker than expected economic data that I'm going to get into, oil prices closed up on the week $73.00 and 61 cents per barrel on the week. I think this is probably the highest weekly close I remember for oil, I think, of the entire move. We're not on the high print because we did get almost to 77, but I don't think we closed the week that high. This could be the highest close. The chart looks very, very strong, even with all of the turmoil, even with the worries coming out of China and the big sell-off there, oil prices are going up. And this is simply going to exacerbate the upward pressure that we're already seeing on consumer prices. I mentioned on the last podcast, the big increases announced by Federal Express and UPS. This is happening across the board, but higher energy prices are a cost component pretty much across the economy. And also, I think a lot of Americans are going to end up suffering a, a very cold winter because I think the cost of heating their homes is going to be astronomically high. This is probably going to be the single most expensive winter unless we get a real break and we get 
a very unseasonably warm winter. And I don't really know what the forecast is. But if we get a normal winter, this is going to be a very cold winter because a lot of people are not going to be able to afford the heat. So people are going to be bundling up with blankets and sweaters. And if we have a brutally cold winter, then it's going to be a real big problem because we might actually end up with a lot of blackouts in that respect. So not only is energy going to be very expensive, it may not even be available. And this is going to have a lot of negative repercussions. And of course, to the extent that consumers have to spend more of their money staying warm, well, that means they have a lot less money to buy other things. And so that's going to be a big problem if you're in the business of selling those other things. You know, you can start to see that in the housing market where the housing market is already starting to cool now because people are being priced out of the market. I mean, particularly the first time home buyers, even with all time record low mortgage rates, people still can't afford to buy houses. Why? Because you have record high prices. Now, mortgage rates are not going any lower. In fact, looking at the action this week in the bond market, mortgage rates are going up. They have nowhere to go but up. And they got a long way to go up. So what does that tell you about home prices? Well, they're the opposite end. They have a long way to go down. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen. But what is also going to happen is new construction is going to stop because the builders now can survey the landscape. The supply of homes is now starting to go up because of the affordability of those homes going down. But what is not going to be going down is the cost of constructing. And I think the cost of building new homes is going to outstrip the capacity of first-time buyers to buy those homes. So housing starts are going to fall. And that means the jobs associated with constructing those new homes, they're going to go away as well. So you are going to see some limitations on future supply because there won't be any new homes built. But what is going to weigh on supply is more homes that already exist coming on the market and those homes staying on the market longer because people can't afford to buy them. And as interest rates start to move up, mortgage rates start to move up, the only way that those houses are going to sell is going to be at lower price points. And as housing prices fall in relation to the cost to build new houses, that means even fewer new houses will be built to the point where no new houses will be built. Because if houses are on the market, and let's say the entry-level homes are on the market at $200,000, but the cost to build those homes is $300,000, nobody is going to spend $300,000 to build a home that's only worth $200,000. So this is going to be a big problem for the economy when the market value of a home greatly exceeds the cost to actually build that home. And this is going to happen, I think, across the economy as inflation really works its way through the system. New stuff is not going to be available because it's going to be too expensive to produce. But the stuff that's already produced may be coming down in price because people can't afford it and it's the only way to clear the market. I think where you're really going to see this dichotomy is going to be the differential in goods prices, versus service prices. And you're really going to see this when the dollar starts to fall and fall in a big, big way. Because what we've seen over the last couple of decades, and even a lot of economists have pointed this out, what are the reasons that the overall inflation rate as measured by consumer prices has been in check is because falling goods prices have offset increasing service sector prices. Because we've been able to import a lot of products from other countries at lower prices, we've been able to reduce the cost of manufacturing by relying on imports for those manufactured products. And that's kept the lid on prices. And cheap imports from abroad have offset the rising cost of services. I think we're going to see the flip side of that. I think we're going to see goods prices going through the roof. And then where we're going to get a break is in services. But the problem with that is that many Americans earn a living providing those services. So if the price of services goes down, that means the income to the service provider also goes down, which means a lot of Americans are going to have a huge decline in their standard of living because the money that they earn from selling their services 
is going to go way down. In contrast, when they take that money and they want to buy goods, the price of those goods is going to go way up because the dollar is going to crash and all of those goods are now going to be much more expensive to import. But it's not just the goods that we import that are going to get more expensive. It's going to be the goods that we export or the goods that maybe we're not exporting now, but we will export when the price goes way up. You see, anything that can be exported will be going up in price as the dollar is going down because those goods are now cheaper for foreigners to buy. And so it's more advantageous for American producers to ship those goods abroad and sell them rather than to sell them in the domestic market. But when it comes to service providers, you don't have that option. You can't export your services. So if I produce a product, let's just call it a widget, I can sell that widget here in America or I can ship it over to Asia or Europe and sell it over there, right? Now, the difference is there's some shipping costs. And so certain products I'd rather sell here locally because there's less cost to transport. But if there's a big difference between what foreigners can afford to pay and what Americans can afford to pay, then it may be worth the added cost of shipping to get into a more lucrative market. So you always have that ability to export what you produce if it's a good. You don't always have that ability with services. Now, there are certain services that you can export. And in fact, the United States has a surplus in services because we have certain, let's say, IT services or things that Americans can do, services that they can perform for overseas buyers. And the price of those services will go up. But there are a lot of services, particularly services provided by lower income people that can't be exported. I'll give you an example, might be a haircut, right? If I am a barber and I'm working in a barber shop, I can't export my haircuts to the Japanese or the Chinese. I mean, if the Chinese are here on vacation and they want to get their haircut while they're vacationing, well, I can give them a haircut, but they're not going to fly over here specifically to get a haircut and then fly back. And if you're a barber in a small town where no Chinese are going to take a vacation anyway, chances are you're never going to even get Chinese customers or Japanese customers or European customers. The only people that are going to come into your barbershop are the people that live in your town. That's your entire market. And if those guys are struggling to buy food and to pay their electric bill, they may not even come to you for a haircut. They may decide to cut their hair themselves. You know, they get one of those flobies or a guy has his wife cut his hair for him. You know, a lot of people were actually doing that during COVID. I mean, my wife was giving our kids haircuts during COVID. I mean, maybe a lot of women learn to cut hair and they don't need to go to a barber. But the point is, if you are a barber, you can only charge what the market will bear. And if your only potential customers are a bunch of broke Americans who are spending everything on food and energy and the cost of everything is going up, the only way you can get them to show up at your salon or your barber shop is to cut your prices. And that's going to be very problematic for the barber who's now making a lot less money cutting hair in real terms. But now everything that barber wants to buy is a lot more expensive. And, you know, you can see this dichotomy. I've experienced it myself uh, when I was a kid. I remember when I was backpacking around Europe in my 20s and I would go to some of these poorer countries and go and get a haircut in a poor country. And haircuts were very, very cheap. I mean, maybe I was paying back then 20 bucks to get a haircut in the States and I get one in Hungary for a dollar, two dollars, whatever it was. I mean, it was very, very cheap. And that's because the dollar was very strong against the foreign. And in real terms, I mean, services were very inexpensive. But, you know, if I looked in the window of an electronics store and there was a Sony TV there, the prices were relatively the same as what I would have paid back home because there you're talking about goods and the goods prices, the people in Hungary who wanted to buy a Sony TV, they had to compete with the people in America who wanted to buy the same TV. So the prices were relatively the same, maybe a little bit lower if the store had lower rent or stuff like that. But in general, the price were about the same. But that barber in Budapest, his only customers are the Hungarians. He can't cut hair for people in New York so he can only charge what that local market will bear and so if you happen to be a tourist coming in to Hungary you get a really good deal on a haircut and one of the things I had been saying at some of my seminars for a long time and obviously I've been saying it prematurely but 
I think one of these days, Americans are not going to have to travel to poor countries to get good deals on services. They'll just be able to stay home. They'll be living in a poor country. It's the foreigners who are going to come here and get great deals on American services. But what that means is if you have the foresight now to get your money out of U.S. dollars and into real assets, into gold and silver, into foreign stocks, into foreign currencies, then you'll be like a rich tourist in your own country because you're going to have the same purchasing power as the rich tourists because you would have already divested yourself of the local currency and you will have your purchasing power based on the same types of assets that they do. Getting back to the markets though, as I mentioned, gold was barely down on the week, but gold stocks got hammered. Look at the GDX and the GDXJ. Both of these indexes are at or hit 52-week lows on the week, and they closed out the week down. I mean, why are gold stocks continuing to go down even though the price of gold isn't going down at all? Again, I think that this market in particular, the psychology of this market is the bearish I've ever seen. I mean, there are no more bulls left really in this market. I mean, people are writing the obituaries for gold and therefore they are reflecting that negative sentiment in the mining stocks because again, the mining stocks are forward looking. It's not about what the price of gold is today. It's about what people buying gold stocks expect the price of gold to be in the future. And everybody expects the price of gold to go down, even though it's not going down. Again, one of the reasons everybody expects the price of gold to go down is because the Fed's going to taper. Well, even if they taper, and they may not, as I said earlier, it's already priced into the market. So what's likely to happen if and when the Fed ever starts to taper, is the price of gold is going to go up. But the gold stock investors haven't figured that out yet, and they're still selling gold stocks based on an anticipated drop in the price of gold. That is not going to happen. In fact, the drop has already happened. The reason the price of gold is $17.50 an ounce and not much higher is because it's already priced in the taper. In fact, I think it's already priced in rate hikes, which of course are never going to happen. So once the market has to price out the stuff it never should have priced in, then gold is going to go way up. But you know, another thing that continues to weigh on the sentiment for gold is Bitcoin. I mean, people are like, well, I mean, what's the point of owning gold? Gold is worthless now that we have Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a better replacement for gold. And of course, that's nonsense because Bitcoin doesn't replace gold in any of the uses that gold has. Now, I mentioned on the last podcast, because a lot of people keep trying to tell me that gold's actual value isn't $1,750, that maybe the value of gold is $200 an ounce or some nonsense like that. And they'll say the only reason it's worth $1,750 is this premium that it gets by being money. And it's that premium that gold is going to take, right? So gold is somehow going to collapse down to a couple hundred dollars an ounce or whatever people think it's worth as a metal. And all of that extra value is going to move into Bitcoin and Bitcoin's market cap. And I mentioned that one of the reasons that gold is so much more valuable than your typical commodity is that it lasts forever. That the gold I have today isn't going to rot, isn't going to decay, isn't going to deteriorate because it's going to be here forever. I mean, your gold is going to outlive you and it's going to outlive your children and outlive their children. There is extra value priced into gold today to reflect the fact that it's going to have value in the future. But it's not just that the gold has value it's that gold can be reused an infinite number of times. That is what is so different between gold and all these other commodities. Because once you use another commodity, it's gone, right? If I buy a barrel of oil and then that oil is used to generate electricity, you can't use it again. If I have a bushel of wheat and I make bread with it and I eat it, the wheat's gone. I can't use it again. It's gone forever. I mean, you have to go out and grow and get some new wheat, but I can't use it again. And if I hold on to it long enough, it's going to rot and it'll never be able to be used. So I either have to use it. It's got a shelf life and I either use it or lose it. But when it comes to gold, you can use it and use it and use it again. It doesn't matter. If I take my gold and I make 
a bracelet out of it, that doesn't mean I'm stuck with that bracelet forever. I can wear that bracelet for a few years. I can melt down the gold and I can make something else with it. I can melt it down and I can use it in electronics. You know, if you find some computer chip, you can melt it down and you can get the gold out of that chip and you could use it again. You know, people used to dig up graves because they wanted to get the gold fillings out of people's teeth. Why? Because they could use the gold again. It doesn't matter that they used it to fill teeth. You melt it down and it's the same gold. You get your gold back again. You can use it and use it and use it again. And it's as good each time you use it. It doesn't lose any of its properties. So even if gold has been sitting in some guy's molar for 100 years buried under the ground, you dig that corpse up, you get that gold out of his teeth and it's brand new. It's as good as the day it was put in that guy's teeth and now you can use it to make jewelry or whatever you want. So that is the other special property that gold has and that's why it commands a much higher price, much more than people might think when you're just looking at what its value is right now and forgetting that price encapsulates all of the future value into today's price. And gold has much more future value than other commodities. And speaking of Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin had a wild ride this week. But again, this was another week that should prove to anybody that Bitcoin is not digital gold. Because I think every day gold was up this week, Bitcoin was down. And every day Bitcoin was down, gold was up. Bitcoin traded opposite of gold. So if Bitcoin were digital gold, you would expect Bitcoin to be correlated with gold. Hey, gold is up a little. Bitcoin is up a lot. Gold is down a little, Bitcoin is down a lot. Not Bitcoin way up, gold down, Bitcoin way down, gold up. That doesn't look like digital gold. That looks like the opposite of gold, right? Bitcoin was correlated with risk assets this week and gold was correlated with the safe haven assets. So gold was correlated generally with the Swiss franc or the yen, although that kind of broke down at the end of the week with gold up on Friday and bonds getting hammered on Friday. So maybe bonds are starting to lose the safe haven status they never should have had because bonds are tied to the dollar and whatever the dollar's fortune is, that's what happens to bonds. And as I said earlier, the dollar's got a long way to drop. And so bonds are not a safe haven. They're only as safe as the dollar, which is not very safe. But Bitcoin was trading with the risk assets. The only exception was Friday. Bitcoin got hammered on Friday. Even as other risk assets went up, Bitcoin got clobbered. And the catalyst for the Friday carnage was news out of China. I mean, China has been cracking down on Bitcoin and now they've cracked down the hardest. They have now made all transactions, private transactions in cryptocurrency is illegal. So it is illegal for anybody in China to affect any transaction. You can't buy Bitcoin, you can't sell Bitcoin, you can't exchange Bitcoin, you can't do anything. Anything you do with Bitcoin is illegal. Now, the Chinese government, to my knowledge, they haven't actually come out with what the punishment is for being caught doing an illegal crypto transaction. So I'm sure they are going to have to announce what it is. I mean, what is the fine? Can you go to jail? And obviously, the harsher the penalty, the more likely it is that people will obey the law, right? If there's no penalty, well, then no one's going to obey the law, right? There's got to be a penalty. But given the fact that this is a communist country, right, they can make the penalty whatever they want. If the Chinese government really wants to outlaw Bitcoin, I think it's going to be a very harsh penalty. I mean, there could be a lot of jail time if you get caught with Bitcoin. I'm not sure what the Chinese jails are like, but I'm sure they're all not that great. I don't think people want to spend a lot of time in a Chinese prison. And so it's probably not worth it if they make it illegal. I mean, sometimes, look, if it's illegal to own a gun, but the gun might save your life, there are going to be people that are going to say, you know, screw it. I'm going to own a gun anyway, even if it's illegal, because if I need it to save my life, it's worth the risk. But you don't need Bitcoin for anything. I don't think people are going to be willing to break the law. Now, criminals, if you're already engaged in a criminal activity, well, let's say you're a drug smuggler, you're a terrorist, you're doing something that's illegal. All right, screw it. I'm going to have Bitcoin because maybe it helps me 
with crimes, or maybe not Bitcoin, maybe Caderno or some other crypto, because you're already a criminal. I mean, on the gun control, there are a lot of people who would like to have guns, but they don't buy them, even though they like them, because they don't want to break the law. There are some people who are willing to break the law because they feel that strongly, but a lot of Americans who might otherwise buy guns don't buy them because they are law-abiding citizens, and they're like, well, I mean, I'd like to have a gun, but you know, it's not legal, so I'm not going to buy one. But there is one group of people who couldn't care less about the gun laws, and those are the criminals. What does a criminal care? He's already breaking the law. He's already risking go to jail, right? You're committing robbery. You're committing all sorts of crimes. You don't give a damn about the law. What difference do the gun laws make? That is the problem. When you have gun control, it's the criminals that have all the guns because the law-abiding people don't have the guns and the criminals know that their victims are defenseless because the victims are the ones that obey the laws and the criminals couldn't care less because they're already committing crimes and they're already assuming the risk of going to prison. So what difference does the additional risk of having a gun? But if you're not violating any law because you don't want to go to prison at all, then you're not going to take a chance of owning a gun. And the same thing is going to happen with cryptos. All of the law-abiding, honest citizens that really don't need cryptocurrency, they're not going to risk going to jail to have it. But if they're already committing crimes and they're already risking jail, then what difference does having a crypto make? And so it'll just be the criminals that'll be owning Bitcoin in the black market in China. Now, the Bitcoin community, they're laughing this off. They're like, oh, who cares what happens in China? You know, they make a big deal about what's happening in El Salvador. El Salvador is insignificant. You know, if China is the elephant, El Salvador isn't even the gnat on the elephant's butt. It's like the amoeba on the butt of the gnat. China is going to be the largest economy in the world, biggest GDP. It is an enormous, rich country, and that market is being totally shut out of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So to make a big deal about the fact that little tiny El Salvador is making Bitcoin legal tender and ignore what is happening in China where it's been outlawed basically contraband shows you how ridiculous the whole thing is and how this is all just a bunch of hype and the bitcoin committee was making a big deal about the fact that bitcoin didn't crash on the chinese news yeah it was down like six or seven percent we're still holding forty thousand we're forty two forty three thousand something like that but you know the market is looking awfully toppy and this is major bad news it was already bad before but it is getting worse as China cracks down even harder on the industry. And a lot of people are also saying, oh, that's just China, right? That's not going to happen in other countries because China is a communist country and free countries like America or other European countries, they would never do that. Oh, yeah? (laughs) Sure they would. And it's not hard for them to do it. Look, guns are illegal. Drugs are illegal. Heroin is illegal. Cocaine is illegal. I mean, The U.S. government made those things illegal so they can make whatever they want illegal. And yes, people still do things that are illegal and they risk going to prison. But a lot of people don't do things that are illegal. The number of people willing to do things that are illegal is much smaller than the number of people who are willing to do things that are legal. The U.S. government can every much as easily as China. It can make laws. Remember, we made it illegal to own gold. I mean, if you can make it illegal to own gold, you can make it illegal to own Bitcoin. And of course, it's much easier for the government to know that you got Bitcoin than to know that you got gold because there's no trace. You own physical gold. You go behind a store somewhere and you hand some guy cash and he gives you a gold coin. I mean, unless they have government surveillance video showing the transaction, they have no way of knowing that you bought that gold. They don't know that you have that gold in your basement somewhere. But if you go online, if you're on your smartphone and you buy some Bitcoin and you're going through these public networks, I mean, there's a digital fingerprint over everything you've done. So if they can make it illegal to own gold, well, they can make it illegal to own Bitcoin and the laws will be a lot more effective because it wasn't that effective. There were still people who owned gold when it was illegal. Now, most people turned in their gold and they didn't own it. They obeyed the law. 
But with Bitcoin, it'll be even easier to enforce the law. And I think even more people will be willing to obey it because of how much easier it will be for the government to track them down if they disobey the law. Look, if the U.S. government perceives Bitcoin as a threat, they will neutralize that threat. They will ban it. I think the reason it hasn't happened yet is because they don't perceive the threat. But if they did, they will. And I think, too, after the market crashes and you get lots of people losing money, they may come in and ban it for our own good because they see all these people that have lost a lot of money and they now try to come in and do something about it and use it as an excuse to take on even more power. In fact, the federal government can simply look at Bitcoin trading as gambling, which in effect is what it is. It's not really investing, it's gambling. And there are lots of laws all over this country that make all sorts of gambling illegal. So the governments can simply say, we don't want our citizens gambling and for their own good, we're gonna make it illegal to transact in Bitcoin. Now, I know what a lot of you Bitcoiners are thinking, all investing is gambling. So why pick on Bitcoin? Well, it's not. When you buy a stock that pays a dividend because it's a company that has earnings, you are making an investment. And there's a big difference between investing and gambling. Now, I know there is a speculative component to an investment in that you're thinking that the price of the stock may go up and that may be one of the reasons that you're buying it. But underlying that speculation at its core is the investment. Because even if the price doesn't go up, you can generate a return simply by collecting your dividend. So you don't need the stock to appreciate. The appreciation would be the icing on the cake. The cake is the underlying return that makes it an investment. Now, I know people would say, well, what about startup companies? They don't have any earnings. They don't pay any dividends. Right. So if you buy one of those companies, you are speculating on something that may happen in the future. But you are not gambling. Right. Gambling is just pure chance. It's luck. There's no real science involved. Now, some gamblers would argue with that, but then you're not gambling if you can turn the tables. Like if you're a really, really good poker player, you can take a lot of the chance out of it if you play enough hands. That may be true with blackjack, too. If you can count cards well enough, scientifically, you may no longer be gambling. You may be able to win. But if you're just pulling the lever on a slot machine, right, you can't beat that machine. The machine is programmed for you to lose and you are gambling. Speculating is very different. And of course, there are benefits to society. If you speculate on a startup company, that startup company gets the capital it needs to start up, to make the investments, to hire workers, to innovate, to do all sorts of things that could benefit society. Now, if you wanna look at something that's purely a speculation, you know, think about a wheat speculator. What if somebody thinks the price of wheat's going to go up and so he's going to buy wheat? You could say, well, that's the same thing as me or somebody thinking that Bitcoin is going to go up and so I'm going to buy Bitcoin. And so they're both speculations. Well, the person who is buying the wheat may have some real reasoning behind his speculation. It might not necessarily turn out, but Maybe he's done his research into weather patterns or harvests, and he believes, based on that research, that in the future there is going to be a shortage of wheat. And so he wants to profit on that future wheat shortage by buying up some wheat now, storing it, and then selling it in the future at a higher price when it's in short supply. Now, let's say the speculator is correct and his wheat ends up being much more valuable in the future because there's a wheat shortage. Well, not only does the speculator make money, but society benefits from that shrewd speculation because now there's some wheat coming into the market at a time where wheat is scarce and people need wheat. And so now you've got the wheat to sell. You're paid for your prudence in setting it aside and speculating correctly, but society benefits because they get the wheat. And in fact, you help to keep the price of wheat lower than it otherwise would have been had you not set some aside to be able to sell it in the future when there's a shortage. Alternatively, if you're just guessing that the price of Bitcoin is gonna go up, you just think it's gonna go up, not because people need more Bitcoin, but because they want more Bitcoin. And why would they want more Bitcoin? Because they think other people are going to want more Bitcoin. It's really just gambling. You're guessing, and it is a zero-sum game. There is no benefit to society from anybody buying your Bitcoin from you. It's just a greater fool hoping to sell to an even greater fool. So it's very easy for the government to 
claim Bitcoin is gambling and just outlaw it for the same reason that other forms of gambling have been outlawed. Now, I'm not in favor of that. I would be totally opposed to the government making it illegal to gamble on Bitcoin just the way I think all gambling should be legal. I don't think it's any of any government's business what I do with my money once I've earned it. And if I want to gamble it away, well, that's my prerogative. It's a free country and I can do what I want with the money that I earn. And that would include gambling on Bitcoin. And I'm not saying there's no benefit to gambling as a form of entertainment, because if people are excited and entertained by gambling and in the process they lose money, but they have a good time losing it, there's nothing wrong with that. Just like people have a good time doing other things that cost money. So the experience of gambling is exciting and valuable, yet that doesn't prevent governments from outlawing it because somehow they claim that that activity is harmful to society and they want to ban it. Well, they can make the exact same argument with Bitcoin. They can say it's harmful to society. It is not the type of gambling that we want to encourage and they ban it. Of course, what's so hypocritical about a lot of these states that ban gambling is that they run lottery programs. And the lotteries are basically the worst way to gamble because you've got the lowest odds of actually winning. You know, whenever you go to private sector gambling, like a casino, the vigorous that the casino operators take is very, very small. So your expected losses are also small. You have a much better chance of winning in an honest private casino than you do when you buy a lottery. I mean, the government likes to outlaw competition saying, hey, the only way you can gamble is at our casino by buying these lottery tickets. And then they make the odds of winning astronomically low. I mean, if there were private sector lotteries competing with government lotteries, the government lotteries would go out of business because no one would be dumb enough to buy a government lottery ticket when you can get much better odds buying a private lottery ticket in a competitive free market. But I think instead of being very complacent about the fact that in the face of all this bad news, Bitcoin has held the 40,000 level, I think they should be more concerned about the fact that it hasn't been able to get back above the 50,000 level and that we're more likely putting in a top in Bitcoin than a bottom. And the next big move is not another move up, but rather a big move down. And before that happens, people should be getting out. They should be getting out of their Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. They should be getting out of their dollars and U.S. financial assets. They should read the writing on the wall and realize what's coming. This is massive stagflation. This is a bear market in bonds that's coming. In real terms, especially a huge bear market in the dollar. This is the 1970s on steroids. It's not stagflation. It's an inflationary depression. That is the economic environment into which we're headed. And you have to make sure that your portfolio is properly positioned to weather this economic storm. 